love of Jesus and the power of the cross. Amen. So we want to talk about epic things. Amen. And today I want to talk to you about some changes that are going to be happening. Oh. And so the title of my lesson is Embracing Change. Amen. Because changes are going to happen in life. Yeah. Good changes, bad changes. But we've got to embrace these changes. We can't fight against the changes. Are you with me? Yeah. If you think about it, the church is the body, am I right? Yeah. And if you think of a baby, a baby changes. A baby yeah. grows. Think of baby Cody. Where's baby Cody? Oh. <laughs> right like, well, now she's she's talking and she's moving and she's uh, she's crawling and she's pretty sure she's gonna be walking. Mm. Now imagine if Chloe was exactly the same one year from now. Oh, that would not be good. You was like, oh no, we don't want her to change. We don't want her to grow. We don't want her to be different. It would not be bad. If you had a baby that was exactly the same at two years old as it was at one year old, that'd be, you'd be concerned. Yeah. You go to the hospital, hey, my baby's not changing. My baby's not growing. And it's the same way with the church. We Sometimes we think that it's good for the church to say exactly the same. We want to stay the, inside this little box. But and that's, not, that's not good. In the same way that the that babies need to grow, the body needs to grow, the church needs to grow. <laughs> and so I want to talk to us about embracing change. Point number one, the church must change. Turn to Acts chapter 10. So as we continue on our Acts series, we look at the church of the first century. And we're going to see that, that not only did it change, but it had to change. And we look at an, an amazing, incredible story. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 1. So we, in, we see in chapter 9, we see uh, Paul changing his life. A dramatic change in his life, which didn't end up impacting the whole church. But at the same time, while this is happening, we see Peter and what Peter is doing. This is the cool thing about the church, is that we, we have the church split up into regions, and different things happen in different places around the, the church. So, Rebecca and I, we were down in the south yesterday with Tommy Will at the end. And they're great. I just love them. They're so cool. But it's amazing to think that right now in the east, there are things happening in the south, things happening in the north, things happening in the west. And as we see that that's exactly how it was. It's like in one area, oh, we've got Paul over here doing something great. And in a different area, we see Peter cranking in this. And so, chapter 10 in verse 1. We see, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is standing, staying with Simon the tenor, whose house is by the sea. Then the angel who spoke to him had gone. Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Mm -hmm. So we see this guy Cornelius is a devout, God-fearing man. This guy was seeking God with all of his heart. He was praying, he was sacrificing, he was giving to the poor. And we, we see that this was, this was awesome. But he wasn't a disciple. He didn't know how to become this. He didn't know what he needed to do. And so because of this, God wanted to radically change the church. And so he says, hey, go and get Peter. Now, at the same time, we see, verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were there on the journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Mm -hmm. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being laid down uh, to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Peter replied. I don't eat anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's was and stopped at the gate. So we see that Peter, he's, he's there, he's, he's, uh, he's serving God, he's, he's at Simon's house doing something for the church, and he has this vision from God. And God tells him, get up, kill, and eat. And he's like, yeah, exactly, God. I was hungry, I just want some food, and he goes to get the food. He's like, no, he's like, no, I'm not doing that, God. It's never 
good idea. If God tells you to do something, you don't want to say, no, God, I don't want to do it. And we see that, that it happened not once, not twice, but three times. <coughs> same thing, same instructions, and I'm probably guessing same response from Peter. <laughs> and after it happened, Peter's like, he, it's, he, he didn't get what it was. It doesn't make any sense. Why would God tell me to do that? Now, for us, we don't see why that's such a big deal. But for the Jews, this was huge. Because if we go to Leviticus chapter 11, come on, yeah. Leviticus is a great book. I know some of us can start to try and uh, stay away from it, but it really helps us to understand the Bible. It helps us understand God, but it helps us understand the, the Jews and the church and all of these things. Why this was such a, a challenge for Peter. So in Leviticus chapter 11, in verse 44, The Bible says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy because I am holy. These are the regulations concerning animals, birds, every living thing that moves about the water, and every creature that moves along the ground. You must distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. So we got to understand why were these laws in place. So God gave the Israelites very specific laws on what they could eat and what they could not eat. And the purpose was being clean and unclean. And it was to distinguish. But it was to distinguish specifically them from the people around them. Is that there were many, many regulations and laws that God really wanted to set apart his people from everyone else. He said, you guys are a holy people. The word holy means set apart. You guys are different. You're special. And I'm going to show you how different and how special you are. By the way that you look, you're not allowed to, to uh, cut your beard the way that other people do. You can't shave your head the way other people shave their head. You can't eat the type of food that other people eat. And this was a big deal, is that we see that Jews did not eat with Gentiles. And it was important because Gentiles would have eaten unclean foods. It's like, we're different from you guys. And so for, for, for God to tell Peter that you need to go, you need to eat these unclean foods, he's like, no, then I would be just like the Gentiles. I don't want to be like the Gentiles. I'm a Jew. I'm different. But we see that God was, was moving. He was doing something new for the first time that had never happened before. So if we go back to Acts chapter 10, mm -hmm. in verse 28, so the men come, they collect Peter, they take him to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius, he, he's like just so fired up. He, he gets down on his knees, and Peter's like, whoa, I'm just a man. Don't, don't worship me or anything. This is weird. Yeah. And Peter, he comes up, and Peter, Peter doesn't beat about the bush. He's pretty direct in verse 28. He said to him, you're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But, yeah, I'm not supposed to be here. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So, when I'm sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me? Verse 33. Peter, uh, Cornelius explains, hey, I saw an angel. Verse 33. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everyone, everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So we've got this bit of a, an interesting showdown. We've got Cornelius, he gets a vision from an angel. It says, send men to collect Peter. Peter gets this vision, eating unclean foods. He's like, oh, what is going on here? He's like, okay, I'm going to come. And Cornelius, Peter's like, hey, I've been sent here. I'm supposed to tell you something. And Cornelius is like, yeah, I sent for you. You're supposed to tell me something. Like, so they're kind of looking at each other, and they're not really sure where to go from here. Verse 74, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So this is crazy. Cornelius, he knows all the doctrine, basically. He understands Jesus came, he was the Son of God, he died, he was buried, he resurrected. He understands he believes all of this. But we know it's not enough to believe it, you have to actually live it up and into practice. And he, um, we see that there's not really any reason why he shouldn't be a disciple, or why he couldn't be a disciple. We see the same thing in Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 8, 
hate with the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was a bit of an outlier. He, already, he kind of didn't really have as much of an issue or prejudice as Peter. He went to the Samaritans. He wasn't really supposed to go to the Samaritans. He went to the Ethiopian eunuch. That wasn't really allowed either. But he, he was just, hey, I, I'm just going to go baptize everyone. But the Ethiopian eunuch, because he was a eunuch, he couldn't be a Jew. And so uh, we see that, that, that this Jewishness was blocking people from getting in. It's like you, then the people wanted to, you gotta be circumcised, you gotta do this thing to be a Jew, to come in. But in verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So we ordered that they be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So this is huge. Peter is being told by God, hey, you got to usher in the kingdom for the Gentiles. we got to understand, for the first seven years, it was only Jews that came in. But God is saying, hey, I want to change the entire church. It's not just about Jews now. It's not about Israel. It's not about the cleanliness laws. It's not about circumcision. None of that matters anymore. That was the old covenant. Now I'm doing something new with Jesus. And because of this new thing, now we're going to open up the kingdom for everyone. Which is great news. Because yeah. the last time I checked, none of us here are Jews. Yeah. So if this change didn't happen to the church, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. So this is huge. This is important. But this was really challenging for Peter. You, you even see, after he gets the vision three times... He comes, he's like, hey, you know everything about Jesus, but uh, you know all this already. And then the Holy Spirit comes on that, and he's like, whoa, the Gentiles get the Holy Spirit too? Yeah. And then he's like, and then he gets, he gets convicted. He's like, man, can anyone like, can anyone stand in the way? Is anyone going to try and stop him from getting baptized? Yeah. It's like, I, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to oppose God. Yeah. And this is the thing, is that when God is moving, we don't want to try and stop him from moving. Yeah. Sometimes people complain that the kingdom doesn't move fast enough Oh, we want changes, we want miracles, we want baptisms. But then sometimes the kingdom moves pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh my gosh, quick, all these changes, I can't, I can't cope with it. And this is the thing, we see this in the Old Testament, that uh, it talks about the presence of God, the cloud. Is that it would, it would, t- it would uh, set out, and when it set out, the people would set out. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it would settle for a few days, sometimes it would be a month, sometimes it would be a year in one place. Imagine that, it's like you're, you're camping for a year, waiting, and then finally, after a year, it moves. And then you go to the next place, and you have to leave the next day. And then you have to leave the next day, the next day. It's like, what? We last year, we moved once. And the last week, we moved five times. What are you doing, God? This doesn't make any sense. And that's the thing is that we, we're not going to try and, and get in the way of God. And when uh, we, we see this in, in the church, we also see this in our lives. I remember when I went to L.A., and uh, I, I went, and the, the plan was... I'm going to go, I'm going to start dating Rebecca, I love London, oh, yeah. she loves London, it's going to be great. So day one, I go, I ask her to be my girlfriend. She oh. said, yes. Day one? Yes. Yeah. I know, I was like, day one, come for three I'll weeks. Right. Come for three weeks and see how it goes, and then maybe make your decision by the end. I was like, I'm going to wait for three weeks. Day one, is like, you want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> and she said, yes. I was like, yes, everything's going to plan. And then day two, I went up and I spoke to Kip, and I was like, hey, Kip, you know how we talked about us dating, she's going to come to London, it's going to be great, like, can you get, like, work on her visa, so we can get her there, like, ASAP? And he's like, yeah, about that, bro. <laughs> so, you know how you're American and all, like, how do you feel about coming to L.A.? And I did not want to go to L.A. That was the last thing on my mind, that was the last thing that I wanted to do. <laughs> but this is what really I had to do. Is that God was really moving in my heart, and He was uh, He was challenging me. Is that this is where I had to go, and I, I learned so many things from my, my time in LA. That um, and the, one of the things that I learned is that sometimes things don't go to, according to our plan. Mm-hmm. Sometimes God changes things, and it changes them for the better. Yeah. I'm so grateful that I went from London to LA. The lessons that I learned there, I brought back here and have used, I've applied to the ministry, and have done so many things. Mm-hmm. So why am I saying all of this? Because there's going to be some changes mm-hmm. across the church, in the region, and it's going to be good. Mm-hmm. So the, the changes, we know that uh, Anthony and Cassidy are going from the West region to Paris. Mm-hmm. And they're taking people with them as like a supplemental mission trip. Mm-hmm. So the question is, who's going to lead the West? Mm-hmm. The answer is, it's going to be myself and Rebecca. We're going to be sent from the East and go to the West. Mm-hmm. Oh. So much. Mm-hmm. The East is a very 
special place. For for ever like for, for me, I remember going to LA and leave my first Bible talk. My first Bible talk was very special. And for, for me, the East is my first region. And this is a very special place in my heart. That when I go on to lead other regions, when I go on to lead other churches, I'm always going to remember my time in the East. I'm very grateful for, for the lessons that you guys have taught me. And it's, it's going to be great. And so Rebecca and I were going, and we're going to take some people with us. We're going to take, um, for the sisters, we're going to take Sam. And we're going to take Bernice, which is going to be great. And then for the brothers, we're going to take Richard. We're going to take um, Haven, where is he? there he is, and then we're also Andy, he's coming with us too. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be great. And uh, we, we really see that, that, that uh, God's going to be moving, he's going to be doing great things. So the question is that if we're going to the West and we're taking some people with us, who's going to come to the East? The answer is, it's going to be Michael and Maria Hart. They're going to be moving from the South and coming up here to be the East. That's going to be great. It's going to be really, really great. And I really want to urge you to just throw your whole support behind the hearts. The hearts are incredible. These guys are veteran disciples. They, they really are amazing. And the, but in the same way, they're going to need your help. They're going to need your support. Yeah. You guys have been so helpful to me in really feeling your love, feeling your support, feeling your encouragement, and that's what they need, in the same way that we needed it. Yeah. So then, if they're coming up from the South, yeah. who's going to be in charge of the South? <laughs> <laughs> so the South, things are going to change up a little bit. The South, instead of being a region, it's going to go to a sector. And in LA, the way that it works is that you have regions, and then a part of regions you have sectors, which is not really a region, it's like a, a part of a region. And so the South Sector is going to be led by Vienna Tomiwa, oh, and the wow. South wow. is going to be... The South is then going to be a part of the West. And so Rebecca and I are going to be leading the West, and we're going to be overseeing the South Sector. Um, Michael, and Michael and Michelle are going to stay in the North, doing that. And then the North and the East are going to be working together and helping each other a lot more. So there's going to, Michael's going to be coming to the East quite a lot and helping out. You guys are going to be doing midweeks together. And then the West and the South in the same way. The South's going to be a sector of the West. So these are the changes. It's going to be amazing. Now, point of all, we know that the church must change. In the same way that the, that the body has to grow, and as a grow, change is going to happen. But, point number two, People are critical of change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a fact of life. We yeah. can't get away with it. When stuff changes, it surfaces people's hearts. Yeah. And people are like, oh, that's not how we did it before. Oh, that's not how Kobe and Rebecca did it. Oh, that's not how it was this or that. And it's, it, that's, that's normal. I'm not, I'm not like surprised or I'm not thinking like it's, it's that. It's just to be expected. And that's why I'm preaching about it right now. Mm -hmm. And we see that this was the same thing that happened in the church. So in chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? So this is, this is crazy. It's like, you're in Jerusalem, you hear, hey, Peter went to this guy Cornelius, they, they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they baptized them, the Gentiles are going to be in the church now too, this is going to be great. They're like, what? No, I don't want the Gentiles in the church. Mm. And it's, it's critical. Now, this is just, it's, in some ways, it's the, Je the Jews who are prejudiced against the Gentiles. But in some ways, it's also just people just, they don't like change. They're just, they're, it's, when something new happens, people get scared. People get afraid. Because yeah. they, they, they don't know it, they've never experienced it before. And uh, this is, this happens. It happened in the first century, it happens today. Yeah. And it's just to be expected. But we see how Peter responded to this criticism. He didn't get an attitude in a bad attitude, but he responds in a very spiritual way. Um, in verse 15, he, he tells them the story, how he went, how he went to be there. And he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us in the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So that even the Gentiles God has granted repentance that leads to life. Amen. So 
So we see Peter, when there's opposition, when there's criticism, he explains what he did. He explained why God was moving in the way that he was doing. And he explains, hey, they, this is what I saw. They got the baptism the same way that we got the baptism. So I was like, and I, I remember the scriptures that says that God was going to pour out his, his spirit even on the Gentiles. So if I saw this and I see the Bible says this, who am I to stand in God's way? Yeah. So when people are critical, and people will be critical. We, all, of, all of you guys, in one way or another, will have a twin of criticism. Right. It's the songs aren't the same way, yeah. the service, the venue, or whatever it is. And that's normal, but we got to remember, okay, what's the spiritual response to this? Mm -hmm. And when we hear ourselves being critical, when we see other people being critical, we need to respond with scriptures. We see that Peter, he didn't just put forward his own opinion. He shared his experience, and then he backed it up with scripture. And so for us, we, we know that we have, uh, one of our core convictions is central leadership. You have a central leader. So that means that we, we get behind the leadership, we get behind the leader's decisions. But we, we're going to say, does this mean that all just leaders, uh, changes happen arbitrarily? Where is this example in the Bible? We want to see, where do we see these things that are happening now in the church? In the Bible too. Because we see that in all throughout the, the first century, people move from one place to another, yeah. and it was to build up the church. Yeah. So I want to just show you guys a few examples, so really to build up your conviction on this, so that way you can remind yourself, and you can help other people when they're critical, when they struggle, when they have questions. Yeah. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Come on. The Corinthian church had some issues. Yeah. They had some sin, they had a little bit of criticism, a little bit of a bad attitude. And so Paul, he writes this letter to them. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 17, he says, For this reason I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere and in every church. So Paul planted the church in Corinth. And Paul, he says, hey, I'm your father in the faith, and you guys have got some issues. So I've, read, I've written this letter to deal with these issues, but I'm sending you Timothy. Mm -hmm. Now, the Corinthian church, maybe they might have had an attitude of this. What? Uh, we're getting Timothy? What, are, you, are we not important enough for you, Paul? <laughs> you, you're going to just send your, your intern to come sort us out? <laughs> and they, they could have gotten an issue, but we see that Paul, he's like, hey, no, I'm not coming to you guys. I've written you this letter, and I'm sending you Timothy. He has my heart, he has my convictions, and he actually explains it, you, gotta, you better listen to him, because I am going to come after Timothy, and then I'm going to sort out all the naysayers. Mm -hmm. So we see that the, the leadership in the, in the church, they sent people to other churches to, to, to address issues. If we go to Ephesians chapter 6, so Corinthians was written to the church in Corinth, and Ephesians was written to the church in Ephesus. In verse 21 of chapter 6, so Tychicus, my dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you may also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending you him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. So we have the church in Corinth. Paul sends him Timothy. The church in Ephesus, Paul doesn't send them Timothy, he sends them Tychicus. And they could be like, oh, well, what? So we don't get Timothy? How can we get Tychicus? We wanted, we wanted to have this, we wanted to have that. But we don't see that's the heart of the church. The church understands that, that people are going to get sent different places. And different people get sent for different situations. Is that Paul understands, hey, Timothy, he's going to be best for sorting out the situation in Corinth. Tychicus, he's going to be best for sorting out the situation in Ephesus. And so we see this in the same way that, that Michael, he understands the needs of the church all over London. He's not just thinking about the North region, he's thinking about all the regions. And he goes, hey, Kobe and Rebecca, they're going to be best for the West. Yeah. Michael and Maria, hey, we need to move them from the South up to the East. That's what's going to be best for everyone. Mm -hmm. And we got to understand that this happened in the church in the first century, and it still happens in the church today. Mm -hmm. We go to Philippians chapter 2. In verse 19, it says, I 
hope in the Lord to send you Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. So here Paul, he's like, he's not sending someone. He's like, hey, I hope that I can send this to you. Is that sometimes we have we have plans. We would like to do it. We would like to send this person to this place. We would like to do it, but not yet. It can't happen. And that's okay. We've got the church here is just going to be okay with that. And in verse 25, he says, hey, I want to send you Timothy, but right now, I think it's necessary, in verse 25, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. So here we have a brother. He goes from Philippi to go to be with Paul, and then Paul's like, actually, bro, no, I gotta send you back. And we see that some people, they're gonna get moved from one place. Oh, you're gonna go to this region. Oh, no, actually, no, you're gonna go back to that other region. And that's, that's what happened in the church. Mm -hmm. And we see that Epaph Epaphroditus, he understood the needs. He said, hey, I'm going to go take care of Paul's needs, wherever Paul is. Oh, the church needs to be back. I'm going to go back again. Mm -hmm. And we see that this is just, just a few examples of the leadership moving people from one church to another to meet the needs of the church. And so I would really encourage you guys to, to study this out, to really to build a conviction on how the church grows and how people move from one place to another. Is that we're all disciples, we're all fully sold out. Mm -hmm. And we, we believe that we're gonna go anywhere, to any region, to any church. If you get sent up to Birmingham, hey, fired up. If you get sent to Paris, hey, fired up. If you get asked to go on the mission team to go to Amsterdam, you're fired up. Mm -hmm. Go anywhere, do anything inside that region, whatever task you're asked, if you're asked to do kids' kingdom, if you're asked to sing, if you're asked to preach, whatever it might be that you're you're doing that. And then to give up everything. We already know that. And so this is very important why. Because we know that there's going to be people that are critical, but that's normal to have normal criticism, but we see that there are people that even more than that. We see that there are going to be people that are malicious, that try to destroy the church. If we skip ahead a little bit in Acts, Acts chapter 20. Acts is so helpful because we see the, the struggles and the things that the church experienced before, and then when we see these same struggles happening again, we're not surprised, we're not like, what? How did this happen? Well, no, it happened 2,000 years ago, it's still happening now. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 25, it says, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the, the kingdom will ever see me again. This is a bit of a sad story. So Paul, he's, he's leaving, um, and he's never going to see them again. That's not what's happening with me and Rebecca. We're not doing this. We're just moving over to the West. You guys are still going to see us at Congregational. You guys are all going to be there for the wedding, right? <laughs> and so that's, that's not what we have happening here. But um, we <laughs> just throw that in there, so in case none of you guys are worried. But what we do see is in verse, um, in verse 25. This is, this is more serious. Um, no. Verse 27, sorry. It says, For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spread the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So Paul gives them a very stern, serious warning. He says, hey, guys, I'm never going to see you again. I'm leaving now, and I've, I've warned you for three years. I've taught you everything that you need to know, but you've got to be on your guard. Because after I leave, people are going to come in. Savage wolves are going to come in and tear apart the flock, tear apart the church. And we see that this is very unfortunate, that sometimes there are disciples. They're even really mature, long-lasting, persevering disciples that then turn away. And then they come back to, to tear apart, to destroy the church. Mm -hmm. And for, for those of you that have been disciples for, for many years, you've seen this. You've seen leaders raise up. You've even seen leaders in the East raise up, that then turn away, that then come back to destroy the church. And the reason why I share this is that um, it's, it's very sad news, but uh, George and Helen Grima have fallen away, which is very sad. The situation, for, for those of you just to, to understand, is that for uh, several years now, there have been challenges with the Grimas. And uh, in this year, including from the EMC moving forward, 
that uh, they've been warned, specifically George has been warned on a number of times against gossip and slander. And so he's gossiped about the church to other people. Um, he's slandered the leaders of the church. And he's been challenged many times. He's been challenged by Michael. He's been challenged by Michael Williamson, Michael Hart, Anthony. Uh, he's spoken directly to Kip. And he was challenged to, to deal with these issues and to really apologize and repent of his gossip and his slander. And unfortunately, uh, two weeks ago, that he, he sent Anthony a text. He says, hey, I'm leaving the church. I'm not coming back. Now, he, we, we need to be praying for them. We really need to be praying that they come back because it's very sad what, what's happened with them. But um, the, because George... He, he was a disciple for 40 years. Yeah. He was in the Church of Christ, he was in the ICOC, he was in the ICC. He, he's been around for a long time, he knows a lot of people. And so I want to warn you guys about that, so that way we can be on our guard. We cannot be surprised with these types of things. And um, again, he, he's not marked, so we, we're not like we, we don't talk to him. Yeah. But uh, we need to be praying for him. And if, if he does try and contact any of you guys, to, um, to want to talk, to want to meet or anything, let me know about that. And let pass it on to, to Michael Hart, to Michael Williamson, so we can be aware of that. And we cannot let these people that, uh, as Paul warned about, that when there's leadership changes, when people are coming and going, that's when the church is vulnerable. Yeah. And so we've got to be, be aware of this. And we need to be praying for uh, George and Helen. If you guys have any questions, you can talk to me about that, you can talk to Michael Hart, you can talk to Michael Williamson, and we can answer more questions if you have about that. But um, the last thing, point number three, pray for change. So if we go back to Acts chapter 12. The church is going to change, we know that this is biblical, but we've got to be praying for this. So in Acts chapter 12, in verse 1, it says, It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to, the, to be guarded by four squads of soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Mm. So sometimes there are good changes. We send out a mission team, we move region for region. Sometimes there are bad changes. Sometimes that, that persecution happens. We see that, that James, one of Jesus' top, Jesus top three guys, is killed. This is a real setback for the church. And then Peter, the other guy, he gets arrested. And so we see that the, the changes are happening. And the church, what they do is, rather than being overwhelmed by these changes, they're praying. Mm -hmm. They're praying specifically for the leaders. They're not praying, oh God, make this situation bad. It's like, no, pray. We want to pray for Peter. God, we know that he's in prison right now. We know that he could be he could be put to death. Herod wants to put him on trial. He wants to execute him just like James. We want to pray for Peter. And I want to put before you guys a very simple challenge. I want you guys to be praying for your leaders. Mm -hmm. The challenge that I want to have is to pray, pray for the church. Pray for people studying the Bible, pray for the changes that are happening, but pray specifically for leadership. Yeah. And the reason why is that ministry is mostly opinion. We've got the Bible, we've got doctrine, we know what, what the Bible teaches about what, how we need to live as disciples. But where we meet, what we do, what, what, do we meet at, um, at UEL, do we meet at Stratford, do we meet at South Woodford? These are opinion matters. Do we meet at 10 o'clock? Do we meet at 10.30? There, there's no there's no thing in the Bible that says this. And even the even the, the changes that are happening is that this is an opinion matter. Is it better for Kobe and Rebecca to be in the East? Is it better for them to be in the West? There's no verse on that. This is this is opinion matters that the leadership has been given the authority to make these decisions, but then they have the responsibility. It's, it's challenging. And because of this, we need to be supportive of our leaders. We need to be praying for our leaders. And so I want to challenge you guys that, especially in these transition periods, to really be praying. Be praying for Michael and Michelle as they're thinking about Paris being sent up, as they're thinking about Amsterdam. How's Amsterdam going to happen? How are we going to do it? How are we going to have the funds? How are we going to have the people? When is it going to be the best time to do it? As we think about the changes for Rebecca and I, Rebecca and I, we're going to the West, we're starting a new region, we're getting married. Marriage is awesome. I'm fired up. I can't wait to get married. But that's going to be a big change in my life. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be things that I'm going to have to change. 
band is going to have to change. We're going to need your prayers. <laughs> We're going to need your prayers leading the West, new campuses, new things. We're going to need your prayers overseeing the South sector. I've never done something like that. Rebecca's uh, overseen a sector before, but I haven't. So this is new challenges, new changes for me. Yeah. And um, to pray specifically for Michael and Maria, mm -hmm. is that Michael and Maria are going to need your prayers. They're going to need your support um, as they come here. It's going to be challenges. It's going to be changes. You guys have gotten used to how Rebecca and I, our style of doing things. Yeah. And maybe Michael and Rebecca, Michael and um, Michelle. Yeah. Maria. Michael and Maria. <laughs> Michael, and Maria. <laughs> no. Michael and Maria are going to have a different style. Yeah. And that's okay. That's actually going to be good for you guys. Yeah. But they're going to need your help. They're going to need your prayers to be able to lead the, the East in the most powerful way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. My challenge for you guys is very simple. Pray for your leaders every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is what's going to really allow the church to explode and to grow. Mm -hmm. So we, got, we need to embrace change. We need to understand that the church has to change. Yeah. It, has to, it has to grow. In the church in the first century, it had to change. It couldn't just be the Jews anymore. It had to grow to open up to bring in the Gentiles. We have to understand that people are going to be critical of change. And this is normal. It's not okay, but it's normal. It's to be expected. And the way that we respond to criticisms and bad attitudes is with Scripture. Is that the Bible teaches that this is, that this is the way it is. We believe in a central leadership. We believe in supporting our leaders. We believe in people moving from one place to another to strengthen different churches. And then finally, we need to pray for our leaders. Because our, our leaders, they need prayers. We need prayers. Mm -hmm. And this is what's going to really help the church to grow. This is what's going to help us to grow and to spread to Paris, to Amsterdam, to grow the, the south into a region, for the south to split into two regions, mm -hmm. for us to, to, to go down to Brighton, for us to go up to Manchester. All of these things, the church is going to have to continue to change again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to spread out and evangelize, not just all of the UK, but all of Europe. Mm -hmm. So, this is my lesson for you guys. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you.